Hello everyone, welcome back to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. We are starting today with uh, Paradiso, canto number one. And uh, I am ready with my battery of uh, Paradiso translations. I have this one, which is the Hollander translation. The New Yorker says is uh, the best on the market. I don't know if I completely agree with this, uh, but uh, it's uh, one of the best ones for sure. Robert Hollander. Uh, then I'm using my Kirkpatrick edition of the Divine Comedy that includes uh, all the three Canticas and uh, this Mandelbaum edition which uh, I've been using for Purgatorio as well and that's another really good one in my opinion so there might be other translations that I will use for future videos but these are my three main English translations that I, I will refer to in this uh, coming 33 videos Canto 1 of Paradiso is actually very, very simple to summarize in its narrative form because here you have Dante and Beatrice standing on top of the Garden of Eden, looking up. Beatrice looks up at the sky, Dante looks in her eyes, then he looks up towards the sun, then he looks back in her eyes, then they realize that Dante realizes that they are actually flying, they are flying up, at incredible speed and Beatrice explains to him why and where they're going. This is uh, the entire narrative of Canto One of Paradiso. If only it was this simple when it comes to the layers of meaning. It's Canto One of Paradiso is almost like a small onion to peel within the huge massive onion which is Paradiso because even physically and visually it's a big onion. All these spheres one inside the other, inside the other. So before we start the reading, I have four uh, crucial points. I think they're crucial that I want to make very, very quickly. The first one, um, and as always, I suggest you read the canto before watching my video, because my videos are more like a guidance and some highlights rather than a comprehensive reading. But if you have, you probably have noticed how completely different already everything is compared to Purgatorio. We are in an environment where there's no more nature, there's mo no more greenery, plants, birds, etc. There is pretty much only the soul of Dante, the soul of Beatrice, eyes, a lot of eyes and, and looks and gazes, and light and music. So we are moving into a very abstract environment and uh, we need to get used to this because that's what Paradiso will uh, look like from a visual standpoint. Second point, very important. Dante already from the very first line makes us understand that the main point of focus of Paradiso is not going to be himself, like he has been uh, Dante the Pilgrim for Pur Purgatorio and uh, Inferno, but it's going to be God. Therefore, the first line starts with la gloria di colui che tutto muove, the glory uh, of the one who moves all things. Everything is rotating. Um, around God in Paradiso from the beginning to the end. Third point, Dante is aware of the massive task that he is putting upon himself of writing Paradiso. He, this is also demonstrated by the fact that uh, when he started Inferno, he spent only one tercet invoking the muses, the goddesses of poetry. For Purgatorio, he used, he used two tercets invoking, invoking the muses. For Paradiso, here, in the first part of Canto 1, he actually uses something like eight tercets. And he does, he's not invoking the music, he's invoking Apollo, the god of the music. So there is a clear notch up uh, when it comes to his tension as a poet and uh, his apprehension in terms of his ability for this huge task. Fourth point, throughout this canto, Dante insists on the concept of transcending, that he expresses in Italian as trasumanar, which is a word that he made up, he created, he invented, trasumanar, and this is a concept that means uh, somebody going beyond what is a human being. Therefore, all throughout the canto there are references and hints at this concept, uh, at uh, a concept, the concept of a human being who is able to go beyond, to almost uh, shed the skin or the envelope of, the, of a normal human being and 
come out slightly different, slightly superior or beyond what a human being is. So let's get started. The first three tercets are incredibly dense. So let's try to read them with, and I apologize in advance if this video is going to be slightly longer than 25-30 minutes. I'll, I'll try to be concise. The very first tercet in Italian. La gloria di colui che tutto muove per l'universo penetra e risplende in una parte più e meno altrove. First of all, la gloria, this glory, is not only glory as we think about, but really it, it, it's used by Dante to convey the sense of light and radiance of God. So, la gloria di colui is the glory, the, the light and radiance of God, who moves everything. And so from the very first line here, we see that Dante is referring back to the utmost philosopher, Aristotle, who talked about the divine as the unmoved mover or the first mover. Very clearly, here Dante is referring to Aristotle. Now, not only that, but in this little word, move, which is coincidentally spelled the same that in English, M-O-V-E, this verb, move, move, is the same verb that Dante uses to close his Divine Comedy, in the very last verse of Canto 33 of Paradiso. So the identity of light and love in Paradiso is confirmed by this type of circularity of the entire Cantica that begins and ends with the same verb. This is one clever little touch that Dante did for the architecture of the entire Cantica. Because of the order that God has willed, this light of radiance, which is, after all, the understanding, the ability to understand it, and the revealed knowledge in everything, is shining more or less and is more or less apparent in different parts of the universe. This is what the first uh, tercet is saying to us. Depending on the nearness of, this, of the created objects to him, to God. Robert Hollander says, uh, the glory of him who moves all things pervades the universe and shines in one part more and in another less. This is his translation, uh, using pervades. Mandelbaum uses permeates, permeates the universe but glows. And Kirkpatrick uses penetrates. Glory from him who moves all things that are penetrates the universe and then shines back, reflected more in one part, less elsewhere. They are kind of close. And of course, the most literal verb is penetrates, because that's exactly what Dante uses. Now, second tercet. Nel ciel che più della sua luce prende, fu io, e vidi cose che ridire ne sa ne può chi di lassù discende. Okay, another dense one. Mandelbaum says, I was within the heaven that receives more of his light, and I saw things that he who from that height descends forgets or cannot speak. Okay, this sky, this uh, heaven that Dante is referring to here, and he's talking about himself, he is explaining here in this verse what he is uh, planning to do with this Cantica of Paradiso. He wants to tell us what he has seen when he's been able to go to Imperium, which is the highest, uh, as we said in my previous video, the tenth of this uh, immense circles that surround the earth. The Empyreum is described by Dante as the heaven that receives more of his light, of God's light, because it's uh, the most, uh, it's where God is. So, in other words, it's the one that is more um, benefiting of the divine light, of this uh, revealed knowledge of the presence of God. Now, let's get ready for the third tercet. Third tercet. Perché appressando se al suo desire, Nostro intelletto si profonda tanto che dietro la memoria non può ire. Mandelbaum translation. For nearing its desired end, our intellect sinks into an abyss so deep that memory fails to follow it. Very interesting. And there is a, an Aristotelian and scholastic study behind this. Because uh, Aristotle, also um, followed by St. Thomas, who repeated this concept, said that memory, the human memory, has the ability to recall um, only the sensible things that it kind of grasps. So if we grasp uh, anything that is earthly, we see 
an event, we see an animal, we see an object, then the memory can grasp it because it's sensible, because it's earthly. Anything that it has to do with the divine, memory is uh, almost abandoning our mind. And that's, that was the, the belief of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. Therefore, this is the reason why memory cannot follow us. This is um, something that really, beginning from the third verse of, uh, of his Paradiso, Dante is taking St. Thomas and versifying his uh, Summa Theologica here, which is uh, really astounding. Personally, this reminds me, but I will uh, touch on this later on as well, these experiments that in, in our day and age are being made on uh, the neurobiology of spirituality, of the spiritual phenomenon and the spiritual activities. It's very, very interesting to hear what scientists are saying about what happens in our brain when we meditate, when we pray, because there is a clear, clear um, link with what Aristotle, St. Thomas and Dante are saying here. They are saying our memory doesn't really follow completely whenever we enter in this uh, transcendent and divine world. What does it mean? It means that we, there, there is some sort of detachment, detachment from where our mind generally is, or at least from how our mind generally operates. And it seems like modern science can prove this, in fact, demonstrate this exact concept. So I'll, I'll touch on this very precisely later, but uh, I've also recorded a video some months ago about a book that's called uh, Why God Won't Go Away by neuroscientist or neurobiologist Andrew Newberg, and so I just, uh, I will link it below. Fourth tercet, veramente quant'io del regno santo nella mia mente potei far tesoro, sarà ora materia del mio canto. Nevertheless, despite this inability of mind and memory to follow into the divine, I will do my best, I will try whatever I can, as uh, Mandelbaum says, as much as I, within my mind, could treasure of the Holy Kingdom, shall now become the matter of my song. Now, let's uh, remember, and uh, if you don't know, I'll, I'll tell you now, this first part of the Paradiso, Canto I, is the only portion of the Divine Comedy where we actually have um, Dante's own gloss. He glossed these uh, first, I think, 12 tercets in a letter that he wrote to Cangrande. In fact, the same letter number 13, where he also gave us uh, a certain um, interpret interpretative guidance uh, on how to read the Divine Comedy. And, uh, and so I'm going to link this letter below this video as well, because it's very important. It's the only place um, in the entire Divine Comedy, where we can actually read Dante's thinking um, about his own uh, verses, his own Divine Comedy. Okay, so from Tercet number five, Dante starts to invoke Apollo. And for eight Tercets, this is all part of his big invocation. Dante wants to become the vessel, or the vase, as he says here, the vessel for uh, Apollo's excellence. And he mentions Apollo's love laurel because in the myth, uh, Daphne, who was loved by Apollo, was then transformed into a laurel. And that, that's why Apollo loves uh, laurel so much. Until this point, one of Parnassus' peaks sufficed for me. This was part of the mythological history. Um, in uh, Mount Parnassus, there were two different peaks. One was consecrated to the Muses and one was consecrated to Apollo. So the one to the Muses has been sufficient for now to Dante, but the other one is now what he needs because the challenge that he has uh, cannot be done and overcome without Apollo's help. So this is why he says, I need both crests. Enter into my breast. Within me breathe the very power you made manifest when you drew Marcias out from his limbs sheath. There was a poetry competition that Apollo was challenged to by Marcias. Apollo, of course, won, and uh, in anger, when uh, he had the victory, he basically skinned Marcia alive. This is interesting because um, Dante doesn't uh, quote this event uh, randomly, but also because 
it does remind us already of this transhumanar, of this uh, going beyond what a human being is. A lot of elements in this canto will uh, echo and hint at this concept. So, in short, Dante is praying for the graces of Apollo to be able to actually write um, Paradiso in the beautiful, majestic way that he imagines that he can do. Then we get to the extremely interesting verse uh, 34, this tercet where Dante says, Poca favilla, gran fiamma seconda. Forse di retro a me con miglior voci si pregherà perché Cirra risponda. Now, Cirra is Apollo, and uh, what Dante is saying here is, great fire can follow a small spark. There may be better voices after me to pray to Apollo for aid that he may answer. So, it's a way for Dante to talk to the future, to talk to us, and say, maybe after I am gone, there's going to be somebody who is able to take these uh, matters in his poetic hands and uh, be able to write them even better than, uh, than me. 700 years have passed and uh, it hasn't happened yet, so we'll see in the next 700 years. Now, the four tercets from verse 37 to 48 are really complicated. It's where Dante talks about uh, medieval astronomy in his usually very compressed way, so the glossing here would be probably books and books and essays and essays. What he says is this, the lantern of the world, which is the sun, approaches mortals by varied paths, but on that way which links four circles with three crosses, it emerges joined to a better constellation, this better constellation is the Aries, and along a better course, and it can temper and stamp the world's wax, Dante likes a lot this image of the stamped wax, more in its own manner, in a way more similar to its own intent, its own will. So, we understand the lamp of the world is the sun, but what are these four circles and the three crosses? In Dante's times, and even in centuries before him, they had this uh, instrument that has been perfected and perfected, it was called an armillary sphere. I'm going to show it in, in this video. Armillary sphere was a spherical instrument that was showing mainly four spheres that were uh, summarizing the universe. And these spheres were the sphere of the horizon, the one of the equator, the one of the zodiac, and the color of the equinoxes. Basically the great circle that is going through the equinoxes. These are the four circles that Dante is referring to. They intersect in such a way as to form three crosses with their diameters. So we have the three crosses in, inside the four circles that intersect and are formed by the four circles. The layers of meaning here are multiple. First of all, circle, the circle reminds uh, us of the divinity, of the divine, while the cross is a um, reference to men, to human being, the, the cross in, within the Christian iconography. Then, maybe even more important, there is this usual reference that Dante does to the four cardinal virtues, four circles, and the three theological virtues, the three crosses. So he is playing with all these symbols and images, and it's very important for him because at the end of it, he's actually telling us that uh, in this moment, when he's describing the story, it's noon in, uh, on top of the Garden of Eden. So, Paradiso is a cantica that starts at noon. We knew that Inferno started at dusk, or in the evening, there was darkness. Purgatorio starts uh, at dawn. We remember the trembling of the sea at dawn. And Paradiso starts in pure glory, and the most glorious moment of the day, of course, is noon. There is a sense of fulfillment. Noon, the glory of the sun, and the fulfillment of the pilgrimage of Dante, and the spiritual fulfillment as well. Also, why is Dante talking about the Aries, the constellation of the Aries, and why is he, to is he calling it the better constellation? Because the Aries was the constellation of uh, the beginning of spring, and uh, it was seen as the better moment of the year, still is really, um, for the creation of life, the, the, the better moment for generation of life. And uh, 
also it was believed that uh, creation from the Christian point of view had actually taken place in spring. That's why Dante is kind of connecting all these dots. Then, still referring to the sun, Dante says, its entry from that point of the horizon brought morning there and evening here. We always need to remember when Dante says there and here, he's referring to where he is writing the Divine Comedy, which is back in Italy. So here for Dante is the northern hemisphere, and there is the hemisphere of Purgatory, or the southern hemisphere. So in other words, he's saying almost all of that hemisphere was white, that hemisphere, the hemisphere of Purgatory, because it's noon in that moment there, and while ours, the northern hemisphere, where all the people are, in the alive people, let's say, in the flesh, was dark. When I saw Beatrice turn round and to the left, that she might see the sun. This also takes another little jump in uh, logic to understand, because if you are in the southern hemisphere and it's noon, and, you, and you're facing east, actually, where Beatrice was facing, then you turn towards the sun, that means you're turning to your left. If you do the same and you are facing towards the east in the northern hemisphere and you turn toward the sun, you're turning to your right. Beatrice turns to her left, she might see the sun. No eagle has ever stared so steadily at it. This also refers to a popular credence in Dante's time, that the eagles were the animals that could really stare into the sun without problems. And there's also a spiritual meaning in the fact that Beatrice, she is so holy in her soul that she can really stare at the divine light without any problem. Then with the Terset, um, with verse 49, Dante says, And as a second ray will issue from the first and reascend, in other words, a ray is generated by a reflection of the first ray, the ray is coming down this way, is then bouncing and generated by the reflection. Much like a pilgrim who seeks his home again, so on her action, fed by my eyes to my imagination, my action drew, and on the sun I set my sight more than we usually do. This is one of my favorite parts of the entire canto, these two tercets, 49 to verse 54. Because there is a lot of, uh, of this loop that is starting to form between Dante's eyes and Beatrice's eyes. In Purgatorio, Dante already told us that the sun is a mirror of the divine light, of the divine, really, a mirror of God. In this particular scene, Beatrice's eyes are then to be understood almost as a mirror of the mirror, because they are reflecting the divine light that is reflected by the sun. So Dante is staring into the sun, he's looking up, staring into the sun with an ability that he wouldn't have on earth in his normal life, an ability that is given to him by the fact that he is on the Garden of Eden and that's willed by God. However, despite all this, he's not able to stare at it for much longer, especially because, as he says here, there is even more brightness that is shining in his eyes now. Suddenly, it seemed that they had been added today, as if the one who can had graced the heavens with a second sun. Now, this was another astronomical belief that between the Earth and the circle of the Moon, or the sphere of the Moon, there was another sphere, there was the sphere of fire. And so it's very probably this sphere of fire that Dante is referring to when he talks about a second sun. And here we get to the real core, the real heart of, uh, of the entire canto, in my opinion, because after having looked at the sun, Dante feels like he has to look back into Beatrice's eyes. And in Italian he says, Nel suo aspetto tal dentro mi fei, qual si fe glauco nel gustar dell'erba, che il fe consorto in mar degli altri dei. Trasumanar, significar per verba, non si poria, però l'esemplo basti, a cui esperienza grazia serba. This verb, trasumanar, it was a neologism. It was the first time that anybody used it because Dante invented it. And uh, as I mentioned, it meant uh, something like transcending the human being. Mandelbaum translates as... Uh, in watching her, within me I was changed, as Glaucus changed. This uh, classical myth uh, 
reference to Glaucus, who was a fisherman, and um, noticing that the fishes who ate a particular kind of grass, they were able to then go back to, to the sea. He tried to eat the grass itself, and he was transformed into a, a marine god, a, a sea god. Obviously, this is another story coming from our good uh, Ovid in the Metamorphosis. So, there is a transformation, a real transformation that happens in Dante. But it's very difficult, it's almost uh, impossible to explain it. This is what Dante is telling us. The way Mandelbaum translates this is um, passing beyond the human cannot be worded. So, he had a spiritual experience that was so powerful and uh, as powerful to feel like he was actually coming out of himself. And this, once again, really reminds us of these uh, ASCs, or Altered States of Consciousness, that are being studied today by scientists today, where there is a, an area of our brain that uh, seems to have less activity after a prolonged prayer or prolonged meditation, and uh, it seems to, in some way, through the phenomenon, a phenomenon called deafferentation, to really explain why somebody who is having a very profound spiritual experience would feel like he is detaching from his own self, his own ego, and is feeling more like what he really is physically, which is just a part of everything, uh, a, a connection with everything else in the world. It's difficult still for us to understand as a phenomenon, but a very, very fascinating point about our human nature. Then it's time for St. Paul to be quoted by Dante. Here at verse 73, Dante says, Whether I only was part of me that you created last, you governing the heavens, no, it was your light that raised me. Uh, the only other case in the Christian history of somebody who had been elevated to heaven was the one of St. Paul. St. Paul um, in uh, Corinthians, number 2, uh, at uh, 12, 2 to 4, he's using very, very similar words to the words that Dante is using here. So Dante is really taking those words and uh, copying them into this verse. What makes me smile is that Dante is using that quote from St. Paul to find a way to explain to us that uh, even St. Paul, when he recollected his, uh, when he recalled his trip to heaven, his journey to heaven, didn't really give us a, a, a specification whether he went up only in his soul or with his physical body. Therefore, Dante uses this uh, open-ended possibility that St. Paul left in the New Testament because he had a doubt. St. Paul expressed this doubt in a way that allows him, allows Dante, to then continue in his trip, in his journey to Paradiso, with his body. In other words, it is a very clever way for Dante to stay very uh, truthful and authentic to Christian theology, and at the same time, allow himself to go up to heaven with his own body, not only his own soul, and therefore experience heaven in a more than only spiritual way. Okay, what happens now? At verse uh, um, 80, 81, Dante is uh, hearing some sounds, some kind of music, probably the music of the spheres, so-called, in the Middle Ages. And uh, he's also seeing even more light, even though he's actually still looking into Beatrice's eyes. And uh, he feels a huge desire to have this explained. Beatrice, che vedea me si comio, meaning in Mandelbaum's translation, she who read me as I read myself. She could see my own soul, my, myself, in the same way that I see it. She answers an unexpressed question by Dante. And she says, you make yourself obtuse with false imagining. You cannot see what you would see if you dispelled it, if you dispelled your false imagining. Now she finally explains to him that they are not in the Garden of Eden anymore, but they are flying at an incredible speed, upward. It always reminds me of this scene uh, of uh, Superman. 
Superman and Lois Lane, flying up together in the silence of the sky. There's something to be said about the fact that Dante realizes that he's flying only after he started to fly. Isn't, doesn't that sound a little strange? Wouldn't Dante have realized that he was starting to fly? He doesn't until Beatrice tells him that they're flying. It reminds me a little bit of how um, trusting somebody works. You trust and love somebody and uh, you, generally speaking, I would say, or at least I'm speaking from my experience, you end up realizing that you really trust that person after the moment when you actually started trusting them. It's a, a rationalization of things that comes after because the actual act of love, of trust, happens somewhere else, not really in your mind or not where your rationality sits. Again, I wonder how my body rises past these lighter bodies. By lighter body, bodies, Dante um, is intending air, fire, all these bodies that are supposed to be lighter than his own. And in this explanation, Beatrice includes uh, a lot of uh, the scholastic philosophy, a lot of uh, what St. Thomas Aquinas had written in his Summa Theologia. St. Thomas says that all things in the universe are uh, tending towards God, however, in different ways, depending on what things they are, what's according to what their nature is. So Dante is fairly organized here in the way that he presents this, because he says, within uh, Beatrice's speech, within that order, verse uh, 109, within that order, every nature has its bent, according to a different station, nearer or less near to its origin, and its origin is God. There are some inanimate things, for example, that are less dear to God, and there are some animate things, and especially human beings, that are more dear to God. This binds the earth together, makes it one. It's always the same force, it's always the same God-willed uh, energy that does all these things that have different degrees of uh, importance and nearness to, to God. Every line, in fact, from, uh, line, from verse 115 refers to a different type of uh, object or element. The impulse carries fire to the moon, fire. Motive force immortal creatures, these are animals, except uh, for human beings. And uh, binds the earth together, makes it one, this is the earth and the force of gravity. And finally, Beatrice adds, also the creatures who have intelligence and who can love, which is the human beings as well. Finally, Dante, it's almost as if he is uh, summarizing the entire human condition in two tercets here, here, because free will we know it's in one sense the center around which the entire architecture of the Divine Comedy rotates. and. Uh, 130 to 136, Beatrice says that there is only one creature who has the power to not follow through um, with this push of the, of the divine bow, that does, has the power to decide to not follow whatever God intends for it, for him or for her. And this creature is the human being. So, from this course, the creature strays at times because he has the power, once impelled, to swerve elsewhere. As lightning from a cloud is seen to fall, so does the first impulse, when man has been diverted by false pleasure, turn him towards earth. These false pleasures are the things that swerve us, that make us swerve and, and drive our Ferrari left and right in the wrong direction. So, Beatrice is saying to Dante, you are now cleansed, you have been purified in Purgatorio, you are free from uh, all that baggage, you're really free from all that baggage of your life, your disordered affections, your disordered addictions, and this is why you're so spiritually light that now God can pull you up towards him. Quinci rivolse in verlo cielo il viso. So finally she turns her face and her eyes towards the, the sky, which is also an expression, an expression of happiness and joy by Beatrice. A little bit of a scratching the surface, as, as always, because there will be a lot more to say, but um, I'm hoping this uh, makes sense. And uh, we are going to talk again in the comments, please, with any type of questions that I will try to answer. 
and uh, very soon with Canto 2 of Paradiso. Thank you very much for watching.